Hello, everyone. Welcome to tomorrow. Today is the 21st of September in the year 2025. And normally at this time, we would be doing our live show, but most of our other hosts were unavailable this particular weekend. So I figured that in a way to make it up to you guys for not having our usual live show, I would still go over with you a few of the really awesome things that have happened this week in the space industry. Probably the biggest news item and most exciting to me is that the Viper Rover, the lunar rover that has been canceled and uncanceled actually a number of times has gotten a ride to the moon. NASA has selected Blue Origin to deliver the Viper rover to the south pole of the moon, not on their first mission, but on the second mission of their Mark I version of their Blue Moon lander. And technically, the announcement is actually a kind of sort of maybe announcement. This Viper rover, which as a reminder, stands for Volatiles Investigation Polar Exploration Rover. Its main mission is looking for lunar ice and ways to potentially extract it. NASA, through the CLPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program, has awarded a contract worth $190 million to Blue Origin for a second CLPS mission of their Blue Moon. On their first lunar delivery mission, and they're going to have a series of instruments on board the lander. And on the second lander, if everything goes well with the first mission, we'll have the Viper rover on board. I believe that the reason they've worded it this way as a kind of sort of maybe they're reserving the option to launch the Viper rover on the second Blue Moon mission is because if things don't go well on the first mission, then on the second, they'll just fly it with instruments again and keep testing out that system. Even in their announcement, NASA said that they would make the decision to exercise that option after the execution and review of the base task and of Blue Origins first flight of the Blue Moon Mark I lander. The important part of this is that the rover has a targeted science window of 100 days that they want to operate on the lunar south pole to maximize the amount of sunlight exposure that the south pole would have. And it requires a landing by late 2027. I'm sure in this recent theme of trying to beat the Chinese back to the moon before 2030 which NASA itself is trying to send astronauts back by 2028. So if this Viper rover is going to fly, it needs to happen before late 2027. However, this specific contract is just for the Commercial Lunar Payload Services delivery mission of a Blue Moon Mark II. There hasn't been any word yet as to whether or not funding has been continued for the remaining amount of tests that need to be done on Viper before its flight readiness. And I'm guessing keeping it in a somewhat state of storage before its 2027 launch date. Even though that hasn't been answered yet, considering how far along Viper is in its development and being basically 95% ready to, to go for a launch, there's a good chance that things will go fine. And if Blue Origin is able to successfully nail their first landing of the Blue Moon Mark I, then it's almost a guarantee that Viper will be launching on their second mission. As of right now, Blue Origin wants to conduct the first mission of the Blue Moon Mark I before the end of this year. And they still have the Escapade mission to launch first for NASA, which is a mission sending two spacecraft to Mars. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done, and at least for the upper stages of Blue Origin's rockets that intend to launch both of those missions, they have been doing their cryogenic tests and static fire tests, but it seems like there's still some work that needs to be done on their New Glenn boosters before either of those missions will be ready. However, here's hoping that both Escapade and their first Blue Moon Mark I is able to launch before the end of this year. If not, then hopefully early next year. In other news, one of Europe's test projects to develop a reusable rocket like the Falcon 9 is getting closer to conducting their first hop tests. The group showed these photos of a fully assembled test rocket in the Themis project. This one's designation is Themis 1H, H standing for hop. 
This is really similar to SpaceX's Grasshopper program that initially had really short hop flights. The first one only went six feet off the ground or 1.8 meters from the metric system. And I would not be surprised at all if this first one is just a very brief hop like that, just a, a meter or two off the ground. Obviously, the purpose of this project is to develop a reusable rocket system and Ariane Group, the company doing this has an interesting way that they want to implement it into their existing products. They make the Ariane 6 and Ariane 5 rockets, obviously, and they've been developing their Prometheus engine using methalox, methane, and liquid oxygen. And What's interesting about their program is there's another one using also Prometheus engines. They've done several test firings and proved out the engine and done several cryogenic tests of the tanks in France. But they're going to be doing the hop tests in Sweden at the S-Range Space Center. If everything goes well, eventually one of the first goals is upgrading the Ariane 6 boosters from solid rockets to reusable liquid boosters using these Methalox Prometheus engines. They would use three engines on the core. The first test version of the Themis rocket only has one engine for the first initial hops, but eventually they will have a three engine version and they're plans from a couple of years ago of having a small launcher based on the same system is essentially the basis of the idea for Maya Space, which is a subsidiary of Ariane Group. So just to give us an idea of the scale, this thing is kind of small. It's smaller definitely than a Falcon 9 and smaller even than the Grasshopper experimental stage that SpaceX tested so many years ago. <laughs> yes, Europe is about 10 to 13 years late to the party, but hey, at least they're doing it. I love that they're doing this. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to see the first hop tests right away. It's probably going to be sometime early next year. Ariane Group said that initially what they need to do is a series of combined tests to interface Themis with the launch pads, mechanical, electrical, and fluid systems before doing cryogenic tests. So they still have to do all of those initial integration tests. And it, the first hop test won't happen until, like I said, at least early next year. However, as a quick reminder, I want to show you how large the team that is working on this entire reusable project is. You're, you're, you're going to be shocked. So at least as of 2013, this is it. This is the entire Themis team that is working on this particular reusable rocket project in all of Europe. That's it. They've already completed the first two goals, and once they complete their initial low-altitude tests going to initial heights, then they'll introduce their new version, the, the T1E, E standing for Extended or Evolved. That'll do some of the more high-altitude flights until eventually doing much higher flights that would be a lot closer towards what real operations would look like. And that would be with a third vehicle, the T3 vehicle, which essentially looks like to me, even from the this tiny little picture as probably an operational Maya space vehicle. Hopefully their team has grown since 2023 and they will be able to start achieving some milestones and goals with their program and be able to convince the directors and ministers of the European Space Agency to invest more funds and start evolving and eventually go from Ariane 6 to Ariane Next. That would be awesome. Anyhow, they are late to the party, over a decade late to the party, but I'm glad they're still doing it and I really hope it works. Meanwhile, American space station company Vast, after doing their structural test article and validating their design, have completed the welding of the actual structure that they intend to fly to space, the first Haven 1 module, and actually the only module they intend to fly like this. They have other designs in mind after this. But this is a tremendous milestone. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done to continue to outfit this into a proper space station. And they have to complete their Haven demo mission, which is their demo satellite, testing out solar panels, batteries, and all sorts of other systems for this space station module. And as a matter of fact, they've been doing quite a few tests on that demo satellite. They already have been doing the different vacuum testing, putting it inside of a vacuum 
chamber. So yeah, I'm really excited for them. And I'm hopeful that that demo satellite will launch on the Bandwagon 4 mission launched on a Falcon 9 rocket possibly this month in September, if not maybe October. And if the satellite needs more time and other payloads are ready, SpaceX will proceed with Bandwagon 4 and they'll have to hitch a ride on one of the other transporter missions and rather rideshare missions, whether it be transporter or bandwagon. They have the two different types right now. If everything goes well on the demo satellite and they're able to keep up this progress that they've been making, they might actually be able to launch their Haven 1 module sometime next year, at least before the end of next year, and conduct their first crewed mission right after that as a demonstration to NASA that they are capable of being hopefully one of many replacements for the International Space Station. Keep it up, Vast. We're all rooting for you. Speaking of the International Space Station, this week the Cygnus NG-23 cargo vehicle was successfully able to berth to the International Space Station after a strange delay with their engine burns. I made a space pod about that, which if you haven't watched already, you can watch right after this. To wrap things up for this video, I did want to show some really cool footage that came out this week for or what are otherwise becoming mundane missions. SpaceX launched a couple of batches of Starlink this week, and what was impressive about it was the timeline, the launch timeline. As the launch progressed, you notice it starts to have a curve. And for those of you who are following the space industry closely, you noticed this already, but I thought this was such a cool upgrade to their timeline and their user interface there, essentially. And they repeated it twice in a row. So this is a permanent upgrade and there is all sorts of potential for this graphic. I know it's just a dumb little graphic, but there's potential for it to be all sorts of crazy awesome for geosynchronous missions or lunar missions or someday Martian missions. So I am really looking forward, even though it's just little graphics to help us follow along to what's going on on screen. I'm looking forward to what else they have in store for us in the future. Finally, if you haven't seen it, Jeff Bezos shared this footage of a recent flight of their suborbital New Shepard rocket. And this was actually the last flight of this particular capsule, their HG Wells capsule. And they had a camera on board and he shared this footage of that. It's two 180 degree cameras Oh my goodness, look at this. This is absolutely crazy. It's two 180 degree cameras that that's what this bubble is that we're seeing rotating on the screen. This is just some of the coolest footage ever of a point of view outside of the rocket, of seeing the rocket and the capsule float away. I, I cannot advocate more for all launch companies to do this, to just throw on cameras that what we're seeing is a, basically a, a 360 camera that is spinning like crazy, two 180 degree cameras that are spinning like crazy. And what they've done is they stabilized this so that we would have this focus on the rocket. I know that this is just a boring old New Shepard suborbital flight, but this is some of the coolest footage that... I've seen in a while, and I would love to see this on even all the boring Starlink launches of Falcon and basically every single flight of a rocket. This would be awesome. Just cool footage. That's it. They were just doing suborbital experiments on this one, including a bunch of student experiments. And like I said, it's almost becoming mundane at this point. So yeah, that's all I got for you guys today of things that have happened over this past week. I am apologizing that the rest of the crew could couldn't be here and us have our usual discussion that we normally have. I certainly was looking forward to getting comments from us, uh, some of the other folks about all of these news stories. So I would like to pass it to you guys and ask you what of these different things that happened this week are you most excited about? Thank you very much for watching this video. Be sure to do all of the YouTube things. And as long as everyone's schedule lines up, we should be back for our usual live show next week. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of our 
our YouTube members who have been supporting this show and for their continued contributions and for those highlighted in yellow who have recently either renewed or signed up for the first time. Thank you very much for all of your support. We couldn't do this without you guys and every single little bit helps. If you're not already, you can support us for as little as a dollar a month to help us produce more space content. Thank you very much to everyone who is supporting us. That's all I have for you today, but until the next time I see you guys, keep moving onwards and upwards, and don't forget, per aspera, ad astra, through difficulty, to the stars.